I'm David Haywood, the convener for the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution World Affairs series of talks. This evening, I will be interviewing Tim McIntosh Smith, who we are planning will come to the BRLSI to give a talk in 2021. Tim specialises in the study of Arabic language and culture and is a renowned writer. By way of introduction, I will read an excerpt from a review of his works created for the New York University Library of Arabic Literature. Tim McIntosh Smith is a fan of Arabic travel literature and the author of several books of his own travels. Of these, the, his trilogy based on the journeys of Ibn Battuta, namely Travels with a Tangerine, The Hall of a Thousand Columns and Landfalls, retrace the Moroccan's wanderings around three continents. These works earned him the 1998 Thomas Cook Daily Telegraph Travel Book Award and appropriately the Ibn Battuta Prize of Honour, awarded in 2010 by the Arab Centre for Geographical Literature. He also co-wrote and presented a BBC TV series on Ibn Battuta, described by The Guardian as marvellous, memorable television. His most recent work, published by Yale University Press, is Arabs, a 3,000-year history of peoples, tribes and empires. According to The Spectator, this book of vast scope and stunning insight, which rebalances Arab history, seeing Islam as part of it, not the start of it. Further fulsome praise has been delivered by a wide range of reviewers, including Ian Black in The Observer, who said, In this wonderful new book, Macintosh Smith combines deep learning and penetrating insights, delivering with dazzling turns of phrase and illuminating comparisons. It was via this book that I first came across Tim, although I did not get to know him until I read his travel writing. Tim is the Fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and a recent Senior Fellow of the New York University of Arabic Literature. His home, for nearly a third of a century now, has been the Yemeni capital of Sana'a. Sana'a, okay, but where Sana'a. are you? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not in Sana'a at the moment. I'm in Kuala Lumpur. Um, and, well, I'm in a sort of exile, I suppose, because um, you know what wars are like. They're terrible things. Uh, I've lived in Sana'a for 36 years plus, and the past five or so years have been solid war. And, you know, real, the, the, the big thing, blitz, bombardment, missiles coming in, um, and I was very happy with that, in, you know, in as much as one can be. Uh, if a missile hits you, you're a goner. Um, if not, you survive. And you sort of get used to it. But um, I'm very close to a family there. And two of the, the, the young people in the family, university age, we just got together and said um, they would have a, a sort of more chance of having a freer education if they went and studied at university abroad. So I said, well, why don't the three of us go and we'll have a, um, a sort of sabbatical from the war? And that's how I see it. Uh, I've, I haven't left Sana'a. Um, it seemed very strange to come out of Sana'a and out of Yemen while it was in that, that, um, that state. Uh, but, but I regard this as a, a sort of temporary exile. Okay. Now, you live in Sana'a, in Yemen. Why do you live there? Why did you choose to live there for the last nearly 40 years? It's a very good question. Um, <laughs> I, let me think. I have to think way, way back. And obviously in all of these things, there are, there are little factors from one's childhood, uh, from one's youth that, that sort of point one in, in a particular direction. And um, I mean, something I wrote about in my Yemen book, because I, I kind of really excavated my memories and excavated my past. 
Um, it was it was a day when I was looking through my father's bureau, and I came across this little sort of red lump, um, and thought, oh, what's this? I must have been, I don't know, five or six at the time. And my grandfather used to make violins as a hobby, uh, and, and this is how he came, how my father came to have this little red lump. Uh, and I said, oh, Dad, what's this? Uh, and he said, oh, it's the blood of a dragon from Arabia. Uh, and in fact, <laughs> it, was, it was a piece of, a lump of dragon's blood. Um, which, is, which is used, which was used by my grandfather for making varnishes for violets. Um, so they kind of planted the idea of Arabia and dragons and excitement in, 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 in my mind. And there were lots of other bits and pieces when I was little. Um, but, you know, getting to when I was a bit older, in, in London in the mid-70s, there was this marvellous sort of opening out to the um, to the Arab and Islamic world. And, and they put on this magnificent World of Islam festival. And as part of this, in the Museum of Mankind, they had a, a sort of mock-up of the souk in Sana'a. Mm -hmm. And Sana'a was, and still is, a, a sort of very traditional looking place, at least the old city. Um, and there you were, right in the souk, with the sounds, the smells, and everything else. And I was, I don't know what I was, I was a, a teenager at the time. And I kind of thought, yes, I must, um, I must go there one day. Uh, I ended up, uh, I was really a classicist to begin with um, at Oxford, but got a bit bored with the classics um, and, and changed to Arabic to be a greater challenge and then decided I needed that that time in in, in, in that sort of marvelous soup this this um, this land of dragons so it was all quite a romantic thing I'm, I must say to begin with okay but you were born in the West country yeah I was born actually um, not far away from where you are at the moment in, in, in Bristol and um, uh, you know, Bristol, Bath, uh, all, all very much part of my childhood and, 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 and youth. Um, my father was a great book lover, so we, we used to haunt bookshops in Bristol. We used to come over to Bath. Um, I went to school in, in, uh, in Bristol at Clifton College, and, and um, my housemaster... Uh, John Barrett, God bless him, he was a real character um, and a real influence and one of those sort of completely cultured people, one of the most cultured people I've ever met, I think. And he had this magnificent house um, uh, just, uh, well, not very far from, from where you're talking to me at the moment, on Whitcomb Hill, called um, Crow Hall. And he would invite the boys in his house, he was my housemaster, over to, um, to uh, you know, have musical evenings, to wander around the garden, to you know, prune things for him, to, uh, and generally to swan around in this, in this magnificent environment, um, you know, which if you're a, a kind of ordinary middle-class lad like, like me, um, it was it was a real opening up, and, and and something like that kind of opens you up to the world. Uh, John John himself was a great traveller. He'd um, he'd been around, knocked around Africa, and written a book about it, and sort of swanned off to Morocco, and and and, and all of these influences come together to 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 open your mind. Yes, I can imagine. Now. You are obviously living in a Muslim country, but you are not yourself a Muslim. How does that affect your daily life and particularly on your travels? Um, I would say very little at all. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, obviously if I'm, if I'm following Ibn Battuta, and this is something we'll come on to later, uh, you know, something very important to him was to go to Mecca 
and uh, Medina and to spend time there. So I can't follow him there. And, and, and that's a big way that it affects me. But um, otherwise, really, not very much. Um, I, in Yemen, I have so long been a sort of fixture and an anomaly and everything else that everyone just accepts, accepts me for what I am and who I am. Um, you know, they don't, they don't, it's one of the questions that they ask you if they're a stranger, you know, one of the first ones, are you a Muslim? Um, uh, unlike in, in, in Britain, I mean, you don't sort of go up to somebody and say, are you a Christian or are you an Anglican or what sort? Um, but people do tend to ask you that. Um, but they kind of take it in, in their stride if I say I'm not. Um, no, I mean, it came up quite a few times in your travel books, you know, where you're wanting to visit a, a mosque or a shrine and they say, are oh, you a Muslim? And you have to explain that you're not. But it seems that quite a lot of the people who look after these places let you in often anyway. Yeah, well, a lot of it is to do with speaking Arabic, actually. Um, because if you speak Arabic and you say the right little uh, prayers and, 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 and little asides, even if you're speaking to somebody else who is a Muslim, you might well use these Arabic phrases and they will just naturally assume uh, that you're a, you're a co-religionist. Okay. Um, I mean, it, my own personal view is that all people with brains, uh, you know, with a sufficient amount of brain cells, if I can put it that way, in fact belong to the same religion. Um, and um, I forget who was it who said that, and, and somebody said to him, oh, what is that religion? Uh, and he said, oh, we never tell anyone. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of, um, you know, if you say I'm not a Muslim, well, you know, part of me is in a sense, uh, and, you know, part of Muslims is Christian and Jewish and everything else. I mean, we all come from the same roots, uh, 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 and, and in the end, what separates us is is little kind of um, theological bits and pieces, um, generally speaking. I mean, even the form of Muslim prayer, the prostrations and so on, were, were actually shared with with um, at least one one um, sort of Christian prayer at the time of. The Prophet Muhammad, which I think I think it still con continues in some parts of the Syrian Church. Okay, I mean, you 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 referred to the fact that you speak Arabic, and in your first book, which wasn't mentioned in the introduction, um, you gave it the title "Yemen Travels in Dictionary Land." Um, it's a curious title. Having read the book, I understand why you gave it that title, mm. but. You'd like to explain a little bit? Yeah, it it um it it does tend to throw people a bit. When it came out in America, they they said, "Oh, you can't call it that because people will think it's a dictionary." Um, and um, you know, it's it's most obviously not a dictionary. No, travels in dictionary land. Um, it the title really performs two functions. Um, I was looking at the land of Yemen, and it's this incredible, you know, you have these great peaky mountains with, you know, the sort of mountains the children draw with sharp tops and everything else. Um, and you have these, you know, sweaty coastal plains and endless desert bits and um, Wadi Hadramaut, which is a, you know, it's a kind of whole world in itself, this sort of sunken world. Uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's a great crack in the earth's surface and you look down into it and oh, it's full of houses and people, palm trees, cities. Um, it's, it's kind of like somewhere out of Jules Verne. Um, so you have all these different landscapes and you have different people living in them. Uh, and they're all kind of subtly different and they speak different kinds of Arabic and they're all very diverse. So the landscape is diverse and the, the people are diverse. And I was kind of looking at all, looking at all of this landscape as, as, as a kind of, uh, you know, dictionary. If, if, 
if you turn to page so and so, or were in such and such a corner of the country, uh, you you could guess what the people would be like. Um, and there's another aspect that people and the land tend to share names. Yeah. So you know, if you go a bit outside Sana, there's an area called Beni Matar, and Beni Matar means the the tribe or the, the sons of of somebody called Matar. Um, so tribes and, and, and families give their names to lands, to mountains, to wadis. Um, and I began to see the whole land as a kind of dictionary. Um, and then I came across, uh, and I must quote you this because it's quite important. I put it right at the front of the book. Um, uh, let me think what he says. It's, it's a quote by Abdullah al baraduni who was the, the, the foremost Yemeni poet, um, it's actually prose, had Al-Ard Gamus Sha'abina, Hadihi Al-Ard Al-Mumtadda, Al-Lati Namat Alayha Gabur Al-Ajdad, Warraqabat Alayha Mawakib Al-Abna'i Wal-Ahfad. How did I remember that? I don't know. Um, uh, but it's it translated, uh, the land is the dictionary of our people, this uh, spreading land on which the graves of our ancestors slept or sleep and on which um, uh, which is trodden by processions of sons and of sons of sons okay. does that explain well, something yes yeah uh, yeah so when uh, i first bought the book i wondered what the subtitle meant but by the time i was not long in, it, it became clear and yeah. the, link, the language and the people and the land is, is very strong. That's, and, and of course there's the other aspect to it, which is my own interest in the Arabic language um, right. and in its total weird um, fascination. Um, and if you remember the introduction, I start off with with, with this kind of, um, I call it dictionary land, and it's a bit like looking glass land, uh, where, you know, um, oh, I'm just trying to think of a word, uh, sada, for example, it means an echo, uh, or, or, or smoke, soot black, an owl, um, a cranium, uh, you know, oh. one word can mean all these weirdly yeah. different things. You mentioned something like a couple of hundred words can mean camel. Oh, uh, no, far more. Um, at least a thousand. <laughs> oh, okay. I um, remember correctly. Yeah. No, it's, it, I mean, some people say it's a thousand. I think actually it's probably far more than a thousand. Um, uh, you know, it's like Eskimos and snow, obviously. If you keep camels, you, you're, you're a bit kind of uh, specific about the the naming of parts or the naming of species. Um, and there's this old uh, kind of Arabist's saw or saying, which goes that every word, do you remember it? Every word means itself, its opposite, and a camel. Yes, yes, I remember um, that. Yeah. And all right, you know, um, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but there are actually one or two words that I've come across that do mean those three things. Okay. There are plenty of words that mean um, that mean themselves and their opposites. Okay. Um, there's there's one word that means something like to um, to bear somebody's sincere friendship and to kill them. Um, so uh, if somebody turns up at your house and says, "Oh, I want to bear you sincere friendship," you mm, yeah, <laughs> double meaning. Um, <laughs> okay, that was your first book. But then you moved on to writing three books about the travels of Ibn Battuta. How did you come to pick up on that theme? Yeah, um, Ibn Battuta, he, he was kind of, he, he's, he's slightly taken off. Uh, I mean, dare I say it, partly because of the books I wrote, but he wasn't that well known, uh, at least in, in, in the, what you might call the West. Um, but yeah, he was to explain a bit. He was a 14th century traveler from Morocco, um, and he he went on the pilgrimage to Mecca, 
uh, uh, but he sort of got into traveling and he just went on and on and on. And he got to China and he got to, you know, right down the East African coast, up into Russia, um, West Africa, you know, the Maldives, anywhere you can think of, he went. And it's because of this great spread um, that I got really very interested in him. And I felt with the first book, I had kind of tried to explain Yemen, this little corner of, of the Arabian Peninsula, um, this fascinating little corner. And then I thought, well, there's this whole fascinating um, Arab or Arabic speaking and, and, and Islamic world out there. And um, how to explain it? I mean, obviously you can't because it's, it's too various and too multifarious and so on. But if you look at it through the eyes of one person, you might be able to give a bit of an idea. Yes. So, well, um, you know, he, he was the ideal traveling companion. So, you know, so for example, one of those books is set in India. Now, you know, if you say, I'm going to write a book about India, um, and you, I, I didn't know really anything much to, about India, but I could follow Ibn Battuta's little road through yeah. it. I mean, I say little, two and a half thousand miles. Um, but at least I could look from that road and, and comment as he did and, and look at um, his mainly Islamic India uh, and, and, and the India of today. Okay. Now, I mean, I saw your television series, however many years ago it was, which interested me. I did not initially, when I bought the subsequent book, Arabs, put those two together. I didn't remember Tim McIntosh Smith from the television series and the author of the book, but obviously it came together. But in terms of the television series, how easy was it to translate the books into the BBC films? Um, well, in the end, it was very easy because I had a brilliant director. Um, uh, or he would have said he had a, um, a not bad um, presenter. Um, but no, uh, Dan, Dan is brilliant, um, Dan Edge. He was one of the executive producers of that um, film about the Syrian war called For Samar. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but some of your um, friends of Brisley might, uh, might well have seen it. Uh, utterly harrowing. Uh, and very different from our series, but Dan is a brilliant TV man, and um, it was he really who, um, with the rest of the team, we managed together to translate books onto the screen. And you know, it's it, it's not obvious how you do it to begin with. Uh, uh, perhaps I can give you some illustrations. Um, let me think. Um, yeah, Ibn Battuta was, uh, he was chief, hardly chief judge, um, chief justice of the Maldives for about uh, nine months or a year or so. And uh, while he was there, for example, he, um, uh, you know, he observed things as everywhere, and he, as he did everywhere, and he wrote this very, very interesting description. And for example, he goes into the great mosque and he um, reads an inscription about the foundation of the mosque uh, and um, includes the inscription in his book. Now, he remembered this. He remembered the wording of the inscription because he, he uh, if he kept notes, he had lost a lot. But about 50, it was 15 years on or so from there that he, he, he wrote or dictated his book. And he remembered the wording of this inscription in the mosque, including uh, to him strange Maldivian names. Um, now the inscription is still there. Uh, it's actually not in the mosque. A copy is the the original is in the museum. But you can you can go and read this and read Ibn Battuta's book next to it, and see that you know he only made a couple of tiny mistakes in remembering the wording of quite a long inscription. Um, people had tremendous memories in those days, or at least people who studied and memorized books. 
So, um, you know, that to me is, is, is absolutely mind-blowing. Um, you know, and, and another thing, he talks about a, 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 a jinni, um, this sort of um, spirit, evil spirit coming out of the sea and demanding a, a virgin every month. Uh, and they took her down to this little place on the shore. Um, um, anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, an altar was found at this spot, um, buried under the ground, and on top of it was the skull of a young girl. So it kind of, you know, it, it, it's, it's visible, tangible proof of what Ibn Battuta was writing about. Um, you know, for me, again, utterly mind-blowing. But these are things in a museum. So you kind of go to the museum and it's dusty and dark and um, they don't work on television. And it doesn't work for me to explain, as I'm explaining to you now. You have to show things in a very direct way. So, you know, instead of using that, uh, we used, for example, the story of Ibn Battuta again in the Maldives. He gets chucked out. He stops at an island on the way, um, a, a sort of outlying island. He was very much into women. Um, you know, as a proper Muslim, he would marry them. Um, uh, and during a very short stay on this island, he married two women um, on top of the four that he had married in Mali, in the capital, uh, and, and then divorced. So we went to this island uh, and uh, asked them about marriage practices and found this guy who was their sort of champion marrier, and they're still famous for uh, multiple marriages. So instead of looking at dusty things in a museum, I interviewed this little guy with this incredibly deep voice who revealed to me that he had married 10 women in one year. Uh, and, and, and that makes for good TV. <laughs> so you, you have to think visual. You have to think um, uh, not out of the box, but you've got to think in the box, you know, in the... TV box uh, and how things work on uh, visually all the time. Um, not everything works actually, uh, at the risk of wandering on and rambling. Um, we did a slot, we were in the Crimea. Uh, Ibn Battuta talks a lot about, about the Black Death. And I wanted to do a slot at this place in the Crimea where the Mongols had actually catapulted infected yeah. bodies over the city wall uh, to, to infect the people they were besieging. And the city wall is still there. So I kind of perched up on the city wall and they filmed me. Uh, and I said to Dan, um, you know, because plague, bubonic plague is carried by rats, why don't we get a rat? Um, and I can have the rat in my pocket <laughs> and sort of say, um, and, and all this plague was because of this little fellow, you know, like David Attenborough. Um, so we went looking for a rat uh, and we found one in a pet shop and the problem was it was white. Um, so, you know, obviously it wasn't a sort of plague rat. So um, uh, I said, well, you know, why don't we get some ink and dye it? And, and at that point, Dan said, no, no, I think, I think we've gone far enough with this idea. So, um, you know, not everything works, but uh, it was great fun translating uh, the books onto the screen. You, you wrote the books about Ibn Battuta and your travels following him, although not in exactly the order that he traveled because mm -hmm. of various reasons. <clears throat> but then you moved what seems into a completely different area to write the book which perhaps you've received the greatest acclaim for which is arabs um why did you how did you come to move from being a traveler and a travel writer to sitting down and writing what must be a six eight hundred page book um yeah i mean it's it... 
Well, the, the, the direct reason is that I was asked by the publishers, Yale University Press, oh. to, to do it. Um, and they asked me back in 2009, I think. It came out last year, so 10 years later. Um, and, well, for a start, I, you know, I, I've never pigeonholed myself as a travel writer. And, and I think... Um, you know, in a sense, all, all, all books are books of travel in, in one sense or another. And, and all good travel books are much wider than just being travel books. They're not, about, they're not just about travel and going to places. And, you know, eff effectively, my so-called travel books, um, uh, the Yemen book and the three Ibn Battuta books, they're, they're, they're mainly to do with time um, and, and you know and what happens to time what happens to things and people and ideas over time um, how we today can relate to the past and, and, and discover things about the past how it affects our present um, so in effect I was always writing about time uh, and, and obviously writing about time is the basis of of, of, of writing history or, or one of them. I mean, if I can give you an example, and I do like concrete examples, um, Ibn Battuta was the guest of uh, a family of the family of royal bards in the Empire of Mali in West Africa. And, um, uh, you know, I went and looked them up and they're still there. And, 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 you know, they still have the same surname. And the chief guy still wears recognizably the same cl clothes that Ibn Battuta described. And they even have the very self-same instrument, not the same kind of instrument, but the actual yes. self-same instrument. It's, it's, it's a balafon. It's like a kind of marimba or xylophone um, that Ibn Battuta describes listening to it's a kind of sacred object um, meeting them and talking to them about this and listening to the, the royal bard's own bards in-house bardic poetic historians giving their their genealogy back to the time of Ibn Battuta all of this it's a kind of bridge across time um, so that's what I've always been into, uh, and, and, and so I kind of slipped into writing uh, um, history as such quite quite happily. Well, I don't slip into writing anything happily. I hate writing. It's horrible. It's 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 a godforsaken job, um, but um, it's good when you've done it. So what are you writing now, or what's about to be published of yours now, following Arabs? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I still don't know how I did it because, because you know, I was doing it in the war in Yemen with with the missiles literally, uh, you know, whizzing down all round, and fears for loved ones and things like that. And and I suppose to to um, sublimate <laughs> my obvious worries, I, I I got into work. So at the same time, I was working on the history. I was working on a, an edition translation uh, of, of, a, of a, an Arabic manuscript. Um, it has been done before, but not really for a couple of hundred years. Um, so I'm, I, I've done a new edition of it. It's, it's a book about Egypt um, in the late 12th century um, called Kitab al Ifada. Uh, and I'm not sure what we're going to call it yet in English, but probably a physician on the Nile. A physician on the Nile. We're still discussing this, but it was written by this very open-minded uh, physician come philosopher come everything. He was a great polymath called uh, Abdul Latif of Baghdadi. Um, and he went to observe Egypt. Uh, or, sorry, he was there, and he decided to observe it and write about it for the the caliph in in, uh, in in Baghdad, and wrote this description. And while he was there, there was this horrible famine uh, 
the Nile stopped rising for three years, and um, uh, you know there were cases of can cannibalism, and and then a, a plague also, uh, a terrible um, epidemic. So you know it has relevance in these times as well. Um, and he describes this with this sort of unerring scientific gaze. You know, we tend to think people before the Renaissance in Europe were not scientists. Well, they were in the Islamic world, or, or some of them were. So he, he, he applies this really scientific gaze to what was going on in, uh, in Egypt, in the famine and the plague. And, and plus, you know, he writes this great, long, fantastic chapter about pharaonic antiquities. Um, uh, you know, pyramids and mummies and uh, the whole lot of them. And, and it's, it's really one of the, it's one of the seminal works of Egyptology. Uh, and plus it's this, it's this amazing reportage and harrowing, horrible, I don't know how I did it in the middle of a war, um, but it, it, I did it somehow. So that's at the kind of editing stage. Uh, and, and it may come out um, uh, with uh, from New York University Press, Library of Arabic Literature, who uh, I must put in a plug for because they because they do some amazing texts and and do a lot of good work in in, in sort of transferring uh, the knowledge of the of, of the Arabic world into into English. So it it could come out this year, maybe next year. Well, that's certainly a, another different kind of book to what you've written before. Um, I had a final question, which was, what might you speak about when you come to the Brilsey? But I think so much could change between now and then. Mm. But one thing is that uh, we're really looking forward to being able to invite you to come and talk to us. And we will take great pleasure in being able to show you around those parts of Bath that you know, and yeah, um, you know, it, it'll be really great to to have you come. It would be lovely to come, and I, and yes, I don't know what I would talk about. I, I you know, if you, if you ask me, I'd say I haven't got the faintest idea. Um, I think it's somehow always best to talk about people, okay. um, and and you know, this is why somebody like Ibn Battuta. Somebody like Abdul Latif, who wrote about Egypt, um, you know, to see through their eyes, it, uh, and, and, and to talk about something through their using their words. Uh, that, that's maybe the direction I'll go go in. But really, at the moment, you're quite right. Um, uh, things are uncertain. Um, yes, we, we don't things are always uncertain. Yes, we don't even know with the current. COVID situation when the Brilsey will be opening, but we are hoping that it'll be open again in, in 2021. So, you know, we'll keep in touch and as Great. things begin to get clearer, we'll have a talk about when you may be coming over to the UK so we can link those two things together. Great, that would be fantastic. And, and I want to come and see those paintings, those ceiling paintings from, oh, yes, yes. from Font Hill. Um, you know, because I've always had a soft spot for for um, Beckford. You know, after all, he wrote the historical. Uh, uh, well, I don't know how historical it is, but he wrote a, a historical novel. Um, uh, Beckford, uh, what's it called? Vathek, um, about the Caliph Alwathek, who I mentioned in my history, of course. Um, Oh, and I've written a historical novel as well that nobody knows about called Bloodstone, just to pl plug it a bit. Um, it's set in the Alhambra. So I'm a man of many parts, a writer of many parts. <laughs> well, at the end of this interview film, we will actually put up uh, references to all of your books. Not, oh, not thank the, you. Not the one about uh, Egypt, because we don't know what its title is yet, but all of the others, just in case any people who watch this uh, interview want to follow up and uh, read any of your books. Thank you very, very much. And don't forget Bloodstone. It's a no. good yarn. 
Okay. Um, I haven't read that one yet, so I, I, I must. <laughs> yeah. uh, and no. also, whilst your um, Ibn Battuta videos aren't available from the BBC, I think some people have managed to track them down on the internet. Of course, you can't say anything about that, but I think that maybe, and see around your house in Sanaa. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, there's me um, sitting there and um, uh, chewing gat, cut, yeah. if you like to call it that. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the mildly stimulant leaf that most people in Yemen chew. Yes, you can see me doing that. And that, by the way, is the secret between the, the, one of the secrets behind my literary out, output, uh, the stimulant nature of, of gat. Okay. Um, on that which, interesting point, sorry. <laughs> uh, which I hasten to say, don't don't look for it in Britain because it's now banned. It's it, uh, Theresa May banned it in her oh. wisdom um, a few years ago. Um, so uh, do, I, I am not publicising banned drugs on your <laughs> grisly <laughs> film. <laughs> Okay, Tim, thank you very much. It's great that we managed to get this interview completed uh, and um, you know, the, the, the connections worked between Bath and Kuala Lumpur. So thank you very much. I'll let you have a, you know, the rest of your day now uh, somewhat relaxed after this interview. Thank you very much. And you go back to, or go to bed, it's middle of the night in Bath. And um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. It's been great. It's been, it's been great. It's been great to meet you. Thank you very much. Bye, Tim. Bye.